Welcome today to the Fireside Chat covering how digital operating platforms enable companies to thrive during COVID-19. Joining us today from Bloom Global is Pravinder Johar, uh, CEO uh, of Bloom Global. Pravinder has a rich, deep background in supply chain management and technology. He has led top software companies providing innovative solutions to the global supply chain industry, as well as managed supply chain systems for companies, including Hewlett Packard. Leveraging his expertise in artificial intelligence, robotic process automation, machine learning, and blockchain, Pravinder is guiding Bloom's next wave of transformative solutions for the supply chain marketplace. Also joining us from Cisco Systems is Jill Slora. Jill has managed operations for Fortune 550 companies, including Hewlett Packard and Cisco, and currently serves as Cisco's Senior Vice President of Customer and Partner Services. Jill is also a member of Bloom's Executive Advisory Board. He has spent his career scaling up operations, optimizing operational performance, and leading international mergers and acquisitions. Uh, and I will turn it over to Preventer to get started. Thank you, Glenn and Jill. Uh, good to have this conversation. I think it's been uh, over a decade since we first started working together at uh, at uh, right. uh, Packard at that time, and, and we have seen a lot kind of in the last uh, decade. I remember uh, the volcano in uh, Europe, uh, which had okay. shut down was all commercial air traffic and then that was mm -hmm. a disruption then we had kind of the earthquake in japan which was another challenge that, that we had to go through uh, we had uh, flooding in thailand if you remember that one that meant that all the storage uh, th there was a huge disruption to that and then there was a fire in one of the memory factories in seoul which also was another mm -hmm. big disruption but what we have seen this year, actually starting with late last year with COVID, has been different. It's been a series of disruptions. Some of them you can see coming. Right? So, so initially we couldn't really see it coming, but then uh, after first couple of months, now now you can kind of start predicting what what will happen in future, and we are seeing it play out uh, to some extent. Uh, so so we'll talk uh, more about that topic. That how uh, how Cisco Systems. Uh, uh, dealt with kind of this um, uh, this uh, disruption and then what you guys are doing uh, but uh, maybe a little bit of a background on bloom global before that and so we founded uh, bloom uh, in 2018 uh, jails has been part of the company as an advisor uh, since that time uh, we founded the company with the notion that uh, we need a platform a platform for the next 50 years uh, for supply chain orchestration, which allows our customers and supply chains of the world uh, to to manage their um, their operations globally on a single single platform. You guys are seeing on the uh, on on the side uh, all the products that we have, but I won't spend too much time on it. And then uh, uh, and, and the notion is a little bit different uh, because we are a cloud based company uh, where, where the focus is on data. And the collective data that how do we use that collective data to enable enable our customers uh, to to handle the disruptions uh, better and and manage their businesses and uh, the, the company has a large number of customers so we have over 10,000 companies uh, which are connected to the platform today uh, so we saw all type of disruptions uh, we are also in 133 countries uh, so, so we saw the global nature of this disrup uh, disruption and how it was rippling through uh, our ecosystem. Uh, but maybe first start off, Jills, if you can talk about kind of how uh, Cisco, you actually had two different type of uh, phenomena. One was this work from home and what it meant for the networking. And then and, uh, Cisco being the leader and not only the leader, but among the top supply chains in the world, uh, how did you deal with kind of that, uh, that uh, change in demand patterns? as well as kind of just the whole notion of uh, running a supply chain uh, and then especially customer operations uh, during this uh, the, uh, this phase. Maybe you can talk a little bit about that one, uh, Jils. Thanks, Pravinder. Um, first off, thank you very much for having me here with, uh, with you to talk about those topics, those very important topics. 
Uh, first off, um, as you know, uh, the only constant is change. And uh, we've learned the lessons. You, you cited a number of uh, examples uh, where we had to uh, rewire our supply chain and our operations to face those different disruptions. I think this time was kind of the mother of all changes. And we had to make sure we adapt very quickly to uh, those uh, very uh, much evolving conditions. Um, if you remember back in March, we had uh, started to really have some shutdowns going on. And what we had to do is that we had to rewire the whole ecosystem and, and supply chain is obviously part of it, but we had to do the same thing uh, upstream and downstream to supply chain. You mentioned working from home. Right now, 95% of Cisco's employees are working from home. We did that because uh, we had to make sure that we keep everybody safe, obviously. And more to the point, my, my team actually has a large base, uh, uh, vendor base uh, working with us uh, from different companies uh, based in different parts of the world. We also have to have our, our vendors working from home too. So we had to make sure we solve problems of security, of access, of all those sort of things. So it was very disruptive and we had to do it in a very short period of time because if I recall correctly, we had to solve everything before the end of our fiscal quarter, which uh, is always something very interesting in Cisco. <laughs> okay. From a supply chain standpoint, uh, Pravinda, we had, we which was basically companies and organizations that were involved in resolving the crisis. So typically healthcare, hospitals, uh, things like uh, uh, national infrastructure. I mean, those customers actually participated in making sure that, uh, you know, the people can actually communicate with each other, which is kind of the core mission of Cisco. So we, we had to do that. We had to put the process in place uh, to make sure we could uh, overcome those difficulties. We had to constantly chase for parts and supplies and making sure things are our colleague, my colleagues in supply chain did an awesome job to make sure that we have not disrupted our customers very much. Um, the other thing also is that um, we had to make sure everything was tightly managed uh, uh, from top to bottom. When I look at this, I'm looking not only at managing suppliers and, and our own supply chain, but also working closely with our partners. Because Cisco mm -hmm. has many companies in the IT industry rely on a very strong network of partners to make sure that uh, we distribute a product across the world. And so some partners had some difficulties and we had to help them. Uh, and then we have also to make sure that uh, we are working closely with them to look at, for instance, when customers can actually get our goods, you know, and we, sometimes we were shipping stuff to our to our customers and doors were closed because nobody was yeah. working there. So we had to do some reverse of that. We have to make sure we understand how to do the reverse logistic of it. So it mm -hmm. was uh, quite a challenge. And, and by the way, I think Cisco is an example that I'm pretty sure talking to other members of the executive advisory board that a lot of us actually had the same issues we had to work with. Uh, other thing we've done also, Pervinder, to help our community, uh, we had a number of uh, uh, video conference systems available in our, in our offices, which nobody was using. And so what we did is that we've actually donated those units to healthcare professionals in particular, so they could actually do some diagnostics uh, remotely versus being actually in, in the hospital. And if you remember well, in these days, uh, you know, like April, May, we had a number of hospitals that were struggling for capacity. So having that sort of uh, video conferencing, being able to actually do diagnosis uh, remote was actually extremely critical for the success of the operation. That's something we did in New York City, for instance, but also in California quite extensively. So as you can tell, you know, a lot of things need to happen and which relies on one constant, which is that uh, change is, 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 is always going on. And I'm, I'm expecting that to continue going forward, having even more changes coming up with the fact that um, I think the whole thing has changed. Okay, if you think about the way we work today, the way we're going to work tomorrow is going to look very different. Uh, and we can talk about, about, about that a bit more in details, but there is definitely, you know, this change factor that will continue to be there for, for a long period of time. Yeah, yeah. And I think if I think of our other customers too, especially from supply chain perspective, it's so what we saw that a um, lot of our domestic customers, as you know, Bloom actually is the operating platform for U.S. railroads. Uh, so every intermodal marketing company is connected to the platform. And we manage kind of all the rates that are uh, that are paid for, for say, something like a container uh, leasing uh, between uh, intermodal marketing companies and um, and U.S. railroads. And there was a ton of changes. Right? So, so for us, kind of as Bloom as a company, I think March 17th is when we 
uh, everyone went home and uh, everyone was kind of working from home because we were digital in nature but not all of our customers were so we still had some customers who were going to office and using desktops uh, and then that's why kind of some of our uh, other high tech uh, customers saw a peak in demand uh, because uh, covid has been kind of a big digitization initiative for that how can people work from anywhere and if they are uh, to which, which meant that there were changes on that side uh, so we saw kind of lot of uh, demand go up uh, one of our customers actually mentioned that um, they had the highest volume month in a, in a decade was this april because they were involved more in the uh, essential services right so if you think of kind of uh, all times when we uh, everyone wanted toilet papers and they couldn't buy it or the water and it was getting ra uh, rationed kind of to some extent uh, at, at uh, your local costco uh, or local grocery store so, so april was kind of very a uh, lot of changes a lot of disruptions on that side uh, too and then kind of we started seeing uh, more of those uh, where um, uh, where ocean in particular uh, people started doing blank sailings. Right? Then on the air, Jill's kind of, I think in April, 42% of all capacity went away. And I know Cisco is a heavy user of air, uh, air uh, cargo, uh, but as you know, there are cargo only planes and there are uh, uh, belly of the passenger planes. So when passenger planes stopped flying, the capacity just went away. Uh, so so uh, kind of, uh, and, and people, who didn't really have visibility into their air cargo because we took it for granted right? for, for forever and you know, if i was talking to one of the customers and they said we always took air for granted if it's not on this flight it will be on the next flight a few hours here or there your product is going to get from one country to the other uh, but this disruption is ongoing right? because the capacity hasn't really really changed and then i think kind of the q4 it is going to actually be a lot more challenging. I think uh, we are in, uh, in Q4 now, uh, but if you think of this year, uh, the air capacity is down, uh, the people's buying behaviors are different. So there's a lot more e-commerce and what they are buying are kind of a lot more goods which can actually ship via air from, uh, uh, from, from Asia to US. Uh, so, so any thoughts on that? Kind of given that kind of you are uh, you are a major kind of uh, uh, air cargo user uh, as a company. Uh, what's been going on yes. with the air mobility and air capacity uh, on, on on your side? Yes. So, so Pravinder, you're totally right. I mean, we um, well, you know we we had to cope with um, a change in um, in air capacity. I remember talking to the person that runs logistics at uh, Cisco that uh, we had some issues particularly with uh, Australia which is uh, a big uh, a big country for us in uh, in Cisco so but that's not just that country I think this is something that was happening across the world and uh, to your point about commerce I mean that that's something I'm actually responsible for in uh, in Cisco and uh, we, we, we had to make sure we could actually provide a level of visibility that um, you know we, we, we cannot uh, do that the thing is when you think about supply chain obviously you have to look from supplier to the manufacturing, to basically your channel partners, to the end customer. And uh, if you lose time, you know, during transit, or, you know, I, I, as much as when you are getting the supplies into the factory, and then when you're getting the products out from the factory to our, our channel partners and then to our customers, this is uh, even more disruptive. So there is uh, absolutely a need to optimize the whole chain, in, including uh, inbound and outbound. And uh, to your point about uh, commerce and everything, I think what's important, and that's something we've been doing at Cisco, is to kind of create a, a commerce platform that's collaborative, that uh, mm -hmm. our, our partners, uh, our customers, and ourselves can actually use to basically uh, transact and do business together. Uh, uh, something that, uh, you know, we need to have at some point, right, is, uh, mm -hmm. is a way to actually include that with some more visibility in uh, in basically the, all the different logistics flow that uh, are coming in and out and i think it will be great because that will allow us to collaborate even further with our partners on uh, that particular piece of the of the, the supply chain right i mean if we were able to kind of uh, provide visibility as an ecosystem between ourselves our channel partners as an example to kind of uh, make sure that um, we know exactly when things are, are, are uh, being shipped and then received and then we can follow this, uh, you know, along the way. We can optimize also, you know. I mean, to your point about uh, 
uh, you know, capacity, you know, when the capacity goes down, it, it's always good to be able to actually collaborate and see how we can cope together with those sort of things. So that's something that will be, I know it's, it's a little bit futuristic, right? But that's something mm -hmm. that uh, I think will make sense to have, uh, you know, at some point so we can actually even continue to collaborate even further in the way we conduct business together. Again, you know, the, the work from home actually has uh, had some impacts in terms of how people are working. I think uh, to your point, you know, uh, using online tools, transactions, those sort of things becomes even more. Cloud-based systems is even more critical because that's the expectation in a way, you know, the infrastructure actually is built. And uh, we see our customers uh, moving that direction fairly significantly. So again, you know, uh, I think uh, this crisis actually done one thing, which is, which is clear. It accelerated some of the digital transformations that customers uh, actually uh, started uh, a while ago. I'm, I'm in front of many customers every day, and, and it's clear that um, this crisis actually not only uh, changed the game, but it actually accelerated things. It accelerated the, the move to cloud. It accelerated the way people are working differently, and uh, also the digitization of, of processes. You know, when, when you work remote, when you have those sort of uh, flows being changed, you've got to digitize. If you're not digitized, you can't have the degree of flexibility that actually is required in this changing world. So those are the things that um, we've been facing with. And, and I know we're not out of woodwork. There's still a lot of things to, to get done. I think the crisis is here, uh, unfortunately, for, for a few more months, uh, maybe more. And so we need to kind of continue to double down on any sort of solutions that will actually give us this kind of digital uh, agility that we all need. And uh, and again, I'm, I'm taking Cisco as an example, but this is something I've discussed many, many times with many different people in the industry. Everybody needs to have those sort of things to kind of uh, be more agile and, and face change. Yeah. yeah. And I think kind of that's why kind of for us, um, and it almost was Jills when we were talking about it in 18, uh, we didn't know that 2020 will be a year when the Bloom platform will get tested so well, right? Because it was a discussion on that you do need to go from uh, giving your customers an Amazon-like experience kind of to, uh, to, to know where things are, when are they going to get there, but connecting all the way back to your suppliers and factories, right? So, so it is the entire ecosystem and logistics being the glue. Kind of which uh, which allowed you to move things kind of from uh, going going back and forth, uh, but uh, uh, but uh, this has been a great kind of accelerator uh, for for the industry uh, as a as a whole. But the other notion that I want to talk about in the last couple of minutes left, and which is what kind of we focus on, that um, we rely on a lot of data. Right? So so we we are an operating platform for major railroads for major ocean carriers. Uh, for major freight forwarders and then and then shippers uh, so a lot of data flows through our our system and till this year or even before this year kind of there was this notion of holding data or saying it's my data and it's my intellectual property and i don't need to share it and what we saw out of covid is that actually sharing data with each other made everyone better right? so, so i think and then this is a notion which um, which probably still hasn't sunk in into uh, into the broader supply chain community uh, but it's been back to kind of for us kind of as a single digital platform with um, kind of billions of data points uh, and then uh, uh, that that go through uh, kind of our uh, our systems today it's the collective data and intelligence out of collective data is more critical to deal with kind of uh, disasters such as kind of covid has been would say siloed data platforms and that's kind of where companies had had issues when they were with their siloed what's your view on kind of this uh, notion of that kind of people need to open up share data with their customers and then potentially even with kind of uh, it's uh, not only customers and suppliers but also with competitors or other people who use the same ecosystem so everyone can benefit uh, benefit from this um, uh, this intelligence uh, from from the data well, as you know, it's always a cultural shift, right? To uh, to go from uh, you know kind of getting your own data to uh, making it a little bit more widely available. I think this has some merit, particularly when you walk into an ecosystem. So uh, I'm not sure we everybody's ready yet to kind of share this so broadly yeah. as you described it. But at least you know uh, the the first step will be to look at ways to share data across your own ecosystem. If you work with partners, yeah. with suppliers, and we own supply chain. I think it, it makes sense to kind of make sure that uh, you have a way to share data. Obviously, it has to be, uh, you know, in a, in a way that doesn't 
have any conflict from a, you know, a confidentiality standpoint and those sort of things. So we need to work those, those issues, obviously. There's also some data sovereignty that needs to be solved as well. But, you know, um, other than that, I think it makes sense because that's the way we can optimize. And I think in, in this world where things are changing, where you have to adapt very quickly, you know, not leveraging the full capacity of what uh, the whole ecosystem offers is, is definitely not uh, optimized. So we need to change that. So again, yeah. I, I think it's it's great. I think this is where we need to go. It's going to take some time because we need to overcome some cultural shifts. Uh, we need to make sure we, we have some policies that uh, allow for this to happen. But uh, I'm hopeful that, um, you know, over the course of the next uh, three, five years, the industry will evolve in, in such a way that this becomes a bit more pervasive and something that we can actually count on. Great. Uh, thank you, for uh, Jills. It looks like we are out of time, but it was good conversation. We can talk for hours, but... Uh... Yes, exactly. at this point. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much.